What about us? What about us? Who is Pink singing about their never complain? Thank God, says. Hello, Pastor. I hope this will be very, very good with you from the Mag die gins van die Heere jou inhaal en jou oortref. So vir oogend, gesels Dain met ons. This morning Dain is um, chatting to us about childhood trauma and how it affects us. Does it affect us at all? Or do we just outgrow it? The things that happen to us in our childhood. How important is it? Um specifically for people who are living with childhood trauma and as counsellors every single day of our lives we are confronted and affected by the pain of people who live with what has happened to them when they were children and um, you know the question is what about us? What about the children? What exactly about the children? She sings so eloquently. Sticks and stones, they may bro break our bones. But then we'll, we'll be ready. We'll be ready. Because, um, yeah, at the mustard seed tree, we are ready. We take you, we love you, we pull you out of the darkness, and we love you back to life. But today, we're going to listen to Dane, because he has a lot to say. This is one clever, clever man. And he's going to be telling us all about the sticks and the stones. Good morning, Dane. Good morning, Dr. Miranda. How are you? I'm well and you. When I see your face, I'm always well. <laughs> I'm happy. Same with yours brings joy and warmth to my heart. <laughs> it does it. At least, at, yeah, you see, I've got many people who bring joy and warmth to my heart, and you are one of the, the great Danes who always <laughs> warm my heart. It's such an honor and blessing to work with you and to have you on the team because I see your work. I watch your, your progress coming through, your progress reports, and you are just... I see that you are growing in leaps and bounds with every single person that you're working with. And that, that is that is awesome. I wish, Dane, don't you always also wish that we could tell people what we do and what we see? Sometimes I do, especially when it comes to things that are avoidable, things that we can stop from happening by advising and, and spreading awareness because I think that's a major factor in people's lives is that they're not aware of what they can do or what is out there or what can happen and if we could only in a way enlighten them and warn them so that they do not fall into the trap because most people make the same mistakes it's the human condition True, true. We, we make cons mistakes continuously. But um, I think if we are enlightened about the effect of the mistakes that we make on our children or with our children, then maybe we'll make less and less mistakes. And maybe, just maybe, the, the children, our children can have a better future. Because you and I, we work with the mistakes that were made a long time ago. Um, and those mistakes were made with and to and against us as mm. this generation. And I hope that today when you teach us about the effects of childhood trauma, that any parent who tunes in today is going to listen up and will make better choices, better decisions and I hope all the parents aren't going to run away now today and feel all convicted. It's not about <laughs> conviction, guys. It's about education. It's about learning what I can do better so that we can have a better generation. So um, please share this live because Dane has much to say. He's clever. He's going to teach me some things today. And uh, I look forward to learning from Dane. 
So please, 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 please share the live. Else I'm going to start pray, crying again. I'm kind of like over crying, Dane, and you. I'll try my best to cry as well. <laughs> when you cry, we need to get this chap's camera open, man. We really need to because he has such a handsome face. We need the world to see what he looks like. At least. Then when, when this live goes on to YouTube, we put in your photo there. And so then even your mom from England can watch you and see. Thank you. Thank you, Liesl, for sharing the live. Thank you so much. So, Dane, first question yes. to you is the following. I have your first for half an hour. He's, you know what? No, never. He has an honors. He's busy with his honors degree in counseling. Ne, nochal, ne. So, are there psychological issues when yeah. childhood abuse happens? Yes, um, there are definite psychological issues which occur alongside interpersonal issues when it comes to childhood trauma and the effects of childhood trauma are long lasting it goes on to affect the individual until later adulthood so the effects in a way if they're not treated or managed or individuals who have experienced trauma don't seek therapy those negative effects don't go away unfortunately in most cases it is permanent and that's why i think it's important to firstly discuss the brain and how the brain responds to trauma especially in early childhood how the brain responds to trauma because it changes the brain and the brain structure and its functioning on a fundamental level. And those changes are permanent, especially when it comes to childhood abuse and adversity. So I think I'll first explain how the brain works. Oh, thank you. Thank this you. Now, finally, I can also understand. Thank you for that. Okay. So... There are several neural circuits in the brain that work differently, especially in people with anxiety disorders. And when, when we deal with trauma, anxiety is a predominant factor in most of the personality, or not most, actually, all of the personality, the mood, and the anxiety disorders. So... The amygdala in the brain and the insula in the brain have been identified as two structures that seem to be overly responsive in the brains of people with high levels of anxiety, which means that exposure to anxiety, the amygdala and the insula are over-responsive in individuals' brains. So the, the anxiety that they are experience, they experience it more than a normal person would because the trauma has affected those regions in the brain. And the amygdala is a complex structure and it has been associated with the storage of emotional memories, processing, fear, and other aspects of emotional and social behavior. So that's why most of these disorders that we're going to be discussing. So, 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 yes. I just, sorry, can we just interrupt this? So the amygdala, that's a part of your brain that controls your emotions. Is that, do I understand it correctly? Yeah. It has to do with the storage of emotional memories, processing fear, and other aspects of emotional and societal behavior. So it deals with emotions and emotional memory. Okay. All right. You can continue. I just wanted to make sure 
that I understand it properly and correctly. Okay, <laughs> so there have been numerous studies conducted and it has been discovered that individuals who experience childhood trauma and adversity and abuse, they have elevated levels of activity in the amygdala. And therefore, a ripple effect occurs. And that's why they develop these kinds of disorders, because they have issues with their emotions, they have issues processing their emotions, they have issues processing and dealing with fear and their emotions as well, as well as dealing with other people. That's why deviancies, which are disorders, occur when a child goes through trauma. Okay. Does that so, make so, sense? Yeah, the, uh, the amygdala. I'm just going to echo back to you and then you say to me, no, you don't understand and you explain it again. So the amygdala is the part of the brain that doesn't develop as it should and that's the storage house, that's the storehouse for all of my emotions and especially my emotional responses. So when I remember, um, if, if I see a flame now and I have a bad memory as a child, maybe around a flame, then this flame that isn't a threat to me now but that was a threat to me reacts, causes me to react um abnormally fearful would is, is that right yeah that is correct because children who experience trauma and adversity they are in a state of chronic fear chronic anxiety chronic stress chronic worry so what happens to the body biologically if you go through such a state your body releases numerous chemicals. It releases adrenaline, it releases norepinephrine. It, the list goes on and on, and those become toxic to the body. And what the brain does as a coping mechanism, it tries to defend itself. But because the stress is so severe, the toxins move over the blood to brain barrier and that's where it starts affecting the amygdala so individuals who have experienced uh, all the childhood adversity and stress and trauma and abuse whether it be psychological or physical in combination, it's very, very bad because it affects the amygdala in the brain. So as they get older, their fear response is, in a sense, heightened, like you mentioned, the candle, where children who grow up in a healthy environment, if something may happen, daily things that we all have to deal with, stresses and worries, that we just say, okay, we have to face it, we have to cope with it, we have to now work through it. Individuals who've been through trauma, especially children, later on develop post-traumatic stress disorder, or they develop stress disorder at a very young age, post-traumatic stress disorder, which means your fear sense is heightened. So things that might seem normal to other people to deal with, their bodies overreact to that stimuli. They're Jane, very sensitive I'm sorry. to I'm stimuli. I'm so sorry. Jane, I'm so okay, please continue. You were, you were ex explaining to us about the post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. So do you have clarity now with regards to, to the brain and how the amygdala is affected when uh, stress and trauma and abuse is encountered? Absolutely. Uh, I understand that, first of all, the brain of a child does not develop as it should or could, especially the amygdala, like you say, and 
um, I'm going to react out of way. So, Dane, every time people give us gifts, I'm going to have to do the thank thing. Just stop dead in your tracks so that we don't lose what you were saying. But thank you, guys. Your gifts mean the world to us. It means that we can do what we're doing. Thank you. Sorry, Dave. Do. Thank you, everyone, thank you. for the gifts. It's much appreciated. Much, much, much. Also, no sweet scoop my gifts. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I have very inappropriate reactions. Do you think, Dane, that my amygdala was maybe damaged and that's why I react so inappropriately at some time? I'm not sure. I can't say it at face value. I don't think from face value that's face validity that there's something wrong. I think you'll have to go for MRIs, but I don't think you need it. <laughs> I don't think you need it. <laughs> look look at this counselor. He wants to put me on MRI. Oh, my goodness. No, okay. no, no. <laughs> but, but Dan, you, you work with machines and stuff. So you said to me that you can remotely check me out and tell me where, where things went wrong. Yes, yes. That is correct. We'll talk, we'll talk about that another day. Okay, so please continue. Teach us about – thank you, Dorothy, so much. Teach us about – the post-traumatic stress syndrome um, regarding the development of the brain in childhood trauma and how does it affect us in adulthood. But you know what you want to say. Let me not okay. read you. <laughs> okay, 100%. So post-traumatic stress disorder um, was always characterized under anxiety disorders. It was clustered under anxiety disorders but it has been moved in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uh, which clinical psychologists use in order to diagnose individuals. It has been moved from anxiety disorders, just like disassociative identity disorder. It has been moved into trauma and stress-related disorders. Okay. So... Post-traumatic stress disorder is highly prevalent in adult survivors of childhood interpersonal trauma. Now, interpersonal trauma simply refers to your dealings with individuals, with people around you. That is what interpersonal trauma is, your interactions with others. It could be family members, it could be fellow pupils. That is interpersonal trauma. And post-traumatic stress disorder develops if the trauma was severe and repeatedly occurred in the child's life. Okay. So, so one, one trauma, um, one smack against the head would probably not be equal to repeated smacks against the head. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Well, if you smack your child every second day against the head, it, it's kind of a repetitive thing. But uh, it also depends on on the severity of the, the abuse. It very much depends on the severity of the abuse. Because the kid could be smacked against the head at home. The kid might go to school and bullies could physically also harass the child. So even though it was just one smack against the head from a parent or authority figure, which the child values and loves, and it happens again at school and it continues for years on end, that is trauma that has been repeated. It's a reoccurring trauma. Yeah. Sure. You know what? I'm, I'm actually... Listening to you now, I'm, I'm even more grateful that Rudy has developed that, that app because I'm thinking of the millions and trillions of children who are bullied daily because you said you get smacked at home against the head and then you go to school and you get bullied there. And, and do you think, Dan, that that when you are disarmed at home, to that extent, that it makes you more vulnerable to the bullies at school? Mm. There are cases where children who 
are bullied at home or abused at home, they become the abusers at school. Okay. And so that is one way that it can go. Um, but kids who are, let's say, abused at home and abused... What was your question again? Sorry. <laughs> I forgot no, now. I, you actually took it into a different avenue because I asked you that if I get abused at home, does that make me more of a, a prime candidate for being bullied? And then, but then you went and you said, well, yeah, it could go that way, but also I could, because of the abuse at home, I could become the bully at school, which I didn't even think. Thank you. Thank you for that one. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. And I would say it also makes the child vulnerable because he or she starts accepting that as being normal. Normal. It's, it's bad when, when evil or abnormality becomes your normality. It, it, I can just imagine, Dane, this, this thing, it, it goes through, throughout your adult life. Yes, it does. It does. And with regards to one of the psychological disorders, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, which is highly prevalent, um, in adults who experience childhood interpersonal trauma, the repeated trauma causes the individual's fear response to be oversensitive and they struggle with daily problems, the daily problems of their life because their fear mechanism gets triggered easily and it makes it difficult for them to deal with problems and overcome challenges. Because stressful events can trigger a panic attack because the body has been so negatively conditioned and the, yes. amygdala, the, the amygdala, amygdala has been so negatively impaired due yeah. to the chronic and repeated trauma that it cannot process fear the way a normal individual can. So that's okay. why they become oversensitive to any stimulus that is perceived as being stressful and then they can even develop panic disorders and have panic attacks that's that's bad can you talk to us a little bit about the panic disorders and the panic attacks what okay. do they look like you know just give us some guidelines there we got you know, I'm just thinking if, if somebody here has that sort of attack, at least they know it's a panic attack and that's where it comes from and that's why. Okay. So a panic attack is a spontaneous episode of intense anxiety and you actually get a disorder which is called panic disorder. And if you get recurrent panic, attack, uh, panic attacks, you have a panic disorder. Hmm. And it is represented by recurrent unexpected attacks. And there, is of, there are often no obvious triggers for this attack. But it is an intense episode of anxiety. And it has biological symptoms. And individuals often state that they feel like they are having a heart attack. They feel as if they are dying because they have palpitations and an accelerated heartbeat. They so sweat. what I'm hearing is you telling me that it actually manifests physically. It's not, it's not just a psychological thing of remembering or being triggered. You have cell memory, body memory. Mm. Exactly the same as burnout. It's psychological strain and pressure and stress that causes you to have an attack and then you get hospitalized. The same with a, a panic attack because they experience a range of symptoms. It feels like they can't breathe. They have chest pain, abdominal pain. They feel dizzy. And for someone who doesn't know what's happening or why this is happening, it's such a frightening experience that they often tell others around them, you need to get me to a hospital, I am dying. And then when the doctor sees them, the doctor can't find a plausible explanation or diagnosis. 
and then the doctors usually yeah. refer them to a psychiatrist because once you have yeah. a panic attack they occur regularly and individuals mostly state that they know when a panic attack is coming they can feel it coming but usually the first time you experience a panic attack you don't even feel it you don't even think you're stressed it's just all of a sudden you have an in intense episode of anxiety with yeah. frightening physical symptoms yeah and and because because of the physical symptoms you probably don't even think but listen this is psychological this boss screaming at me and me now getting heart palpitations and and Dane is that the angina that people get uh i think that is that caused by other things but it depends because it's so unique the person might have other biological comorbid issues and the stress of the attack the panic attack can trigger mm -hmm. enormous enormous amounts of norepinephrine and all of those stress hormones that can have a negative effect on the body such as the heart and they might actually get a heart attack if there it. are underlying comorbid conditions biologically because the as i said they often report to those around them it feels like i am dying and that's scary hey that's mm. very very scary and all of this from unresolved or untreated childhood trauma mm. because you know, the amygdala like has been and and i also would like to mention that people can also develop these type of disorders panic attacks or st post traumatic stress disorder they can also develop it even though they had a healthy childhood if their their lives as an adult or as a, a later on middle age wherever at whichever point they are in their life they can still develop this but these disorders that i'm mentioning now are specific to childhood trauma but that doesn't necessarily say they can't develop it later on in life Yes, yes. Okay. So, um things that go, go wrong in my life and my reactions to those things are not necessarily because of childhood trauma. I could have grown up in a very very happy home, but um it's it's more prevalent if my childhood was not as happy and stable as it should have been. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, you are correct because everything we are discussing today according to research has been established to be connected to childhood trauma. It's very important that we make our children's lives free of trauma. Guys, mm. remember this live can be watched on YouTube. So if you miss it today or if you need to go or if you have a friend who um is in trouble as an adult or if you notice that somebody is not really treating a child um in 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 a good way perhaps uh, please refer them to this video and let them have a listen to what Dane is saying about childhood trauma let's just you know do better by our children let's do better than what was done to us let's never forget what was done to us make a better way make a better future okay dan so the 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 next thing that you're going to discuss there okay so last thing about post traumatic disorder which i would like to mention also especially with regards to childhood trauma 80% of the time it is comorbid comorbid with anxiety and mood disorders so 80% of people who have post traumatic post traumatic stress disorder have depression okay as well especially when it comes to childhood trauma 80% of individuals who have post traumatic stress disorder due to childhood adversity also have comorbid depression 
Talk to me about comorbid depression. I need to understand that. Okay. So comorbidity basically means a mixture of disorders that occur together. So someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, because their symptoms are so distressing and they do not know how to cope with it, their likelihood of developing major depressive disorder becomes increasingly more likely. So then they end mm -hmm. up developing depression. So comorbid means we uh, two or more disorders occur at the same time within an individual. And the process is usually it develops from one and overlaps into another one. So if we take post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, people who have PTSD, especially because their fear response is limited, and they misinterpret stimuli to a degree that it affects them and their body and that they go into a panic attack, they can develop phobias as well. So they can develop a phobia, which is an anxiety disorder, uh, disorder such as social phobia. Okay. And they can develop this because of what happened to them interpersonally with their dealings with people when they were younger. So I then they that. develop social phobia because they think it's better to stay away from people. Mm. And and that then could also lead to to isolation. Um, yes. And isolation is, is never good. We need to interact. You need someone to deride you from time to time, someone to make you angry, someone to cause you a little bit of stress because that's life. Um, so, so if I'm listening to all of this correctly, Dane, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm hearing you saying that um, my my off the whack, off of the bat, um, out of line responses as an adult could be because of what I experienced as a child. My my insane fear of, of lighting a candle, my mm. insane fear of speaking in front of people, you know, or, or just simply speaking up. I'm in an office and I never say a word. I just do my work. I just, and then I go back to my desk. And in a meeting, if I, if I have enough courage to go to the meeting, I just don't say a word. Is, is that what you're referring, referring to? Yes, as I said, um, it can be trauma caused by childhood adversity, which can lead to deviations in what they consider normal behavior. Okay. Or it could be to traumas that happened later on in life. Because what happens is whatever happens around us, we cognitively process that and we kind of form a belief around that event and we respond in a certain way. So at whatever age the trauma might occur, because it was such a, let's say, negative experience, we develop a cognitive bias belief against that situation, such as talking in front of people. You could have lectured at the age of 30 in front of 20 people and people started laughing at you and from there on you decided I'm not going to talk in front of people anymore or I'm not going to talk anymore because there must be something wrong with me and it can even be a combination of both which makes it worse. Okay, now the, the damage to the amygdala caused during childhood trauma. Can it ever be turned around? And Madeleine is saying, I can't do it not from day to day, I to talk to as it's my plan, I can Okay, so, so she's basically concurring with what you said there, that um, her childhood trauma has affected her so badly 
that she just um, basically, it sounds to me like she didn't stand up for herself. She just rather keeps quiet. Mm. And then, but but you all also, just now you said something different, um, like me. I just talk all the time. You, you challenge me, I fight you back. I'll, I'll kick your knees off, both of them. <laughs> so so yeah, it could it could go both ways. Um, I could either be too afraid to stand up or I could be the bully. Mm. And, and that's the thing about psychology. It could be a multitude of factors that contribute to how you act and behave and how you process things emotionally. Because um, something can happen to you as a child mm -hmm. something can happen to you in adulthood yes. if it happens to you as an adult something negative can happen and it can lead to the fact that okay i'm just not going to talk to people anymore because the person i love the most let's say your husband or your wife they just don't listen to me they just don't hear me they don't acknowledge my feelings they don't acknowledge my emotions Yes. But when that is coupled with childhood trauma, where as a child you were always just seen, not heard. Yeah. You were not allowed to share or express your emotions or feelings. Because boys it's, don't it's, cry. Yes. Boys don't cry and girls uh, cannot uh, exhibit, I won't say aggression, but girls if they speak their mind or say things they're seen as being cheeky and naughty, whereas if a little boy hoists a tantrum or gets angry, ah, oh, it's just because he's a boy. That's what he yeah. does. And that's reinforcing negative behavior. And with a girl, you're actually telling her, you can't, you say, say, you can't just express your feelings and emotions because that's not what little girls do. Yes. yes. Girls it's are okay. ladies. Dane, clearly everybody failed with me. Hey? <clears throat> I just failed to grow, in, to grow into a lady. I'm just me. Just like just me from yesterday. I'm just me. But now, oh. Dane, here I read, mm -hmm. Shadow says, this abaya lonely place. Mar mm -hmm. When we kind of like isolate and we don't interact sorry you broke up <laughs> she's saying it's alone <laughs> sorry she's saying shadow is saying here that uh, first she said she said this by moeilik aangesien jy alleen wil wees en vertrou niemand nie so first of all um, the childhood trauma causes you to isolate and you don't trust people. So trust is very, very important. And and childhood trauma can cause you not to trust. And then Shadow goes on to say, this a by a lonely place, maar toch beter, maar ook gevaarlik. Yes. Yeah. People tend to, due to trauma, due to hurt, due to pain, they withdraw themselves. And they withdraw themselves and they're alone and they feel better because they have the sense of I'm protected because I'm not out yeah. there. So no one can hurt me. However, they're in a place where they're alone with themselves and they're mm. alone with that hurt, which caused them to withdraw in the first place, which caused them to retract. So when they do that, all of these feelings, emotions, and thoughts start coming up. And then they have to deal with that. And sometimes it's so overwhelming that you can't deal with it because it's simply just too much and you don't know how to deal with it. So it, it actually reinforces a sense of loneliness. Yes, because you were alone as a child in the abuse and now that you're an adult because you don't know any better and because your amygdala has now been damaged your actual physical part of your brain has been damaged you then just continue to kind of stay out of trouble as an adult 
And so you don't assert yourself at all. You just try and stay out of trouble, in a sense. Or you yeah. say, screw this. You know what? My amygdala is damaged in any case. And, and everybody just hurt me. And I'm going to hurt everybody out there. Um, that's, mm -hmm. It sounds like you're saying we either have the one response or we have the other response. Um, very rarely. Uh, are there documented cases that, that adults, people, have survived childhood trauma and actually gone the, the middle path route of not isolating and not attacking, being normal then? Yes. Look, because psychology is so dynamic, because humans are dynamic in nature. So whatever, whatever happens to you, you can either go yiltemal rechts, of Yiltemal links, or you can decide to go a different way. It all depends on individualistic factors. So it can be either very bad or very good, or it can be somewhere in the middle, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree with that. And, and, so what I'm hearing is that even as a child, throughout all of this trauma, with your little amygdala being damaged, you, you are still, or you should still be able to make a choice to say how this is going to affect me or how I'm going to allow this to affect me. Yes, you, you get people who are very resilient. It's like the analogy of twins growing up in a very bad household where the moms are alcoholic and the the dad is absent the one kid becomes a drug user and the other one continues to be a successful lawyer so if your amygdala is damaged and you learn by means of either doing research or by going and seeing someone or simply we get introduced to people in our lives with much wisdom. It can be a grandmother, it can be a, a, a brother, it can be a cousin, it can be an auntie, it can be an uncle. And we can learn from their wisdom. So they can teach us. Because people with childhood adversity and all the disorders that they have, it is manageable and treatable. But you have to teach them how to deal with their triggers, yeah. how to develop the appropriate social skills. So you have to teach them certain things that they should practice in order not to fall back into a dark space. Yes, yes. Um, so, Dan, in, in counselling, in adult counselling, we spend a lot of time in, in the childhood of almost every person. And then it is, like you say, to train new social skills, to say, but you know what, it's it's okay when, when you have that. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the treatment of triggers, how, how to respond, how to not allow triggers to affect you negatively? Okay. The first step, because a trigger is something that causes an intense, an intense emotional experience within you. So, the first step is to become attentive in your life, to become mindful in a way to your circumstances and what's going on around you and your interactions with others. It can be something as simple as someone just not putting the toilet paper roll the way you want it. And that can trigger you. So the first step is to become aware of what triggers you. Because if you are aware of your triggers, you can work on them. Because if you're triggered and it invokes a feeling of sadness and you're aware of it, you can then go and work on it and go through a process of inner healing where you sit and you think why did this make me sad and then you can relate it to things that might have happened in the past 
And understanding that then will help you deal with that trigger because you know where it comes from. Because if you don't know where it comes from, you won't be able to deal with it or handle it. A simple example is someone who is an adult who goes to their office to work and their supervisor says, you never do your work, you're always lazy, you're always late, and immediately you become angry because this guy is on your neck, he's on your case the whole time, 24-7. So the anger is a trigger, it's an emotion that is being manifested. Mm -hmm. So then you go home and then it's quad for alles and amal. But instead of doing that, and you sit with yourself and think, Ma, why did I become angry? What did he say? Then yes. you might be able to connect the dots and say, but when I was a kid, my parents, my mom or my dad, they could never acknowledge my accomplishments. I could never do anything right according to them. So then you can connect that past trauma with what is happening currently. And I mean, then you experience sadness. Because as a kid, when you were reprimanded by your parents, the first emotion that you felt was sadness because you're trying your best to do this or you're trying your best to do that. Yeah. So to overcome your triggers, you need to become attentive towards them and you need to realize what emotion is predominantly manifesting and is it the true emotion? Because that anger might actually be sadness. So if yeah. you're going to try and deal with it as an anger thing and snap at everyone, then other triggers are going to happen. Nothing's going to get better. But when you go sit with yourself and realize, oh, no, it's because I'm sad because this and yeah. that happened, you're yeah. removing that root. So then the next time when your boss is on your case and stuff, you don't become offended or triggered. Because then you understand where it's coming from inside of yourself. So, so what I'm hearing there now is that you're telling me that sometimes um, there's a, a misrepresentation of of the true emotion. Like you said, now some my response could be anger, but but I'm not really anger. Angry. I'm actually sad because it reminds me of when I was treated. In a similar fashion, as a child, and mm. that saddens me. And now my boss treats me like this also in a similar fashion. But now, instead of getting sad, I get angry. So it's a, mm. um, it's a misrepresentation of the emotion that, that I actually feel. Because yeah. it's a screwed up amygdala. That thing is now out of whack. Yeah, because it struggles with, with our regulating your emotions and processing everything that you misinterpret it. I usually use the, the analogy, if you think of a tree, if you're going to pluck all the apples, the apples are going to grow, they're going to grow back. Now, the apple is the emotion you're seeing, you're witnessing and experiencing. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to try and deal with just the anger by removing it, it's not going to work. If you go to the root of the tree, which is sadness, and mm. you work on that sadness by telling yourself you are worthy, you can accomplish great things. Yes. That's where the self-love comes in. Then that trigger will slowly but surely start to decay and go away. If we work with the manifesting emotion, we won't come right because mm. yes. that is that is just the the oppervlakige absolutely so so you you're telling me stop treating the symptom go to the cause yes okay gee Dane, uh, you you speak so interestingly there's so much to learn about childhood trauma and and i think especially for people who have survived childhood trauma um, mm. For me, there's definitely after today a better understanding of why I react the way I react um, because I haven't dealt with all of my childhood trauma. Um, so, so maybe it can. I think it's a part harder to talk about this, Dane. 
Marleen is zijn, ik relate bijvoorbeeld als die toiletrol niet opgezet is, dus ik wil niet, dan gaan ik vreselijk te keren. Ach, <laughs> Marleen, dit is, dit is funny, want ik ek, ek sê altijd die toiletrol met een zekere manier op, want as daar een spinnekop is, dan wil ik die spinnekop zien. want ik is bang, hy bijt my in die bad, verstaan jy, daar is spinnekop op die toiletrol. Ik <laughs> heb nogal voor mijzelf een beetje logic bij hierdie hele story gesit, maar ik weet niet. ik denk, I'm just trying to, to fool myself. Dan het jy, het jy nog um, iets daar wat jy vir ons wil leer van die childhood trauma en die effect wat het op ons as volwassene het? Oké, okay, so ek het nou gepraat oor die the post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a stress or trauma related disorder that childhood, that has been linked definitely with childhood okay. trauma that manifests. Then, sorry, I'm just reading here, Lizette is saying rejection is a very big source of anger and sadness and all kinds of emotions. So she's saying, mm. talk to us, can you talk to us a little bit about the rejection and and the, the branch responses that flow from rejection? Okay. Rejection usually comes with abandonment as well. Because once we feel rejected, we feel a sense of abandonment. And in the beginning, when we experience those emotions and we link them to stuff, it depends on your situation or what, whatever happened to you that made you feel rejected or abandoned. You struggle to deal with them and to understand them. So then they go to anger. Because you can't understand it, you immediately become angry. Because how could they abandon me? How could they have just left me like that? So your first response is to become angry towards whomever abandoned, abandoned and rejected you. So after you've been through that phase of anger, you become sad. Because now in your head, you're saying all these things, how could they do this? They're useless. How could they just throw me away? Or how could they have done this and that to me? And after verbalizing that or thinking that, you fall back to the rejection and abandonment. Mm. And that's why you become sad again. Mm, mm. <coughs> and then because, um, yeah. a, a sad result of the rejection is um, the self-rejection. Because yeah. if, if, uh, if people, if my mother and father rejected me, then, then I should also reject myself. How can I love myself? I'm not even lovable to my parents. Because mm. what children do is they internalize. They internalize everything that happens to them. That's why kids blame themselves for their parents having a divorce. It's not their fault. So they internalize whatever happens in the immediate environment. Kids tend to blame themselves. That's why the part of ch uh, child psychological abuse is blame, criticism, and humiliation. Because they internalize that, and then they fixate on it, and then they start feeling abandoned, rejected, useless. Mm. All of those negative things that has been projected by the parent becomes yeah. their reality. Because yeah, they look up to their parents. But Papa and Mama says divorce. Because a little kid, if you have a little boy or a little girl, and there's a thunderstorm, and he runs to his mom or his dad, and his mom or dad tells him, don't worry, baby, everything will be okay. You are safe. That child believes the mom and believes the dad with mm. no question at all. And yeah. that's an example of how everything the mom and dad says, the kid takes it as being true, that it mm. must be true. It must be true, yeah, because they don't know any better. And then what about the inner voice that 
eventually replaces the voice of the parent. And the mind, the brain doesn't really understand. The brain, the mind doesn't really understand that it's not an external voice. And the the mind doesn't have the brain doesn't have a mind of its own. It believes whatever it's told. So if I was told, don't worry about the thunderstorm, it's not going to hurt you. That's fine by my parents, and so I believe my parents. Mm -hmm. And now, when there's a thunderstorm, I tell myself it's nothing. It's oh, that's nice. I, I like thunderstorms, opposed to. Um, Thunderstorm, mom and dad says, yeah, it's because you're so naughty and now Jesus is angry and he's moving around the furniture and he's mm -hmm. going to come down and pinch you on your butt just now. And now when I hear a thunderstorm as an adult, I, I don't like it. I close the shutters and I lock my doors and I pull the curtains because thunderstorms are bad. I could get hurt. Is that is that what you're telling me? Yeah. So it's with the the good the good things your your parents say and implant kind of in you that you remember, but the bad gets remembered as well. And like you said, we internalize their voices and later on in life, it becomes our own. Yes. That's why I tell people to be attentive, to be mindful to their thoughts because if they are mindful towards their thoughts and they listen to how they talk to themselves in their mind, <laughs> like someone will say, for example, Vidya Vat, I always forget things. I can never do something right. Mm, mm, mm. Or I just can't get through this. Uh, I'm, I'm not able to. If they sit and they're attentive and mindful, they'll realize that that voice is someone else's voice. It might be a friend, it might be a husband, it might be a lover that told them these things repeatedly and then they started believing it. That's why when I work with people, I tell them, love yourself and no negative self-talk because whenever you talk to yourself in your mind negatively, it's not your voice. No. It is something that has happened to you, something you've been through, that has caused you to believe it to be true. And that's not necessarily true. Anything that makes you feel down, sad, depressed, anything that does not uplift you does not come from within. And when you start being attentive and mindful, just like with the triggers, you start realizing, oh, but my ex-husband always used to say, "Ye kan niks raag doen nie. Or my mom. Or my dad. And then you are able to change that because it's also something you internalized and decided to be true. But when you start working against it, because the more you're mean towards yourself, you start believing it and your behavior is going to start exhibiting that. It's like when people say, oh, it's just one of those days I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Or you get people that say, if you're going to have that mindset, everything is going to look forkeerd because you're in a disgust gruntle discom discomfort in your mind yes, so you're yes. not gonna behave rationally mm -hmm. you're not gonna focus on what you're doing because these thoughts are constantly there so everything is gonna fall flat or go wrong Dane do you have any um, advice so mm -hmm. I, I wake up and I don't feel happy I feel, like you say, disgruntled. Um, mm -hmm. And I have thoughts that, uh, yeah, it, it's going to, today is just going to be a mess. Do you have advice how how to make it better before I get out of bed? Because this, <laughs> what I'm thinking that the second I get out of bed, it's kind of too late. I've, I've got to set my mind straight. 
you know, before I get out of bed, do you, do you have any advice there? Okay. I'd say get off the other side of the bed. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> what I have done with individuals and what I've done with myself is when I wake up and I feel like that, immediately what I do is I lie down and I recall everything that I am grateful for. And I thank God or whoever the person believes in, or even if they just make a mental list of things that they're grateful for. Thank you that I could wake up this morning. Thank you that I have a bed. Thank you that I was protected. Thank you that I am healthy. Because once you start doing that, you're moving your mind out of a space of negativity into a space yeah. of positivity. Mm -hmm. Because shifting your focus is a very important thing to do. Because you're moving from the darkness towards the light. And it can be difficult. Yeah, but yeah. I'll tell you, if you start comparing the things that are wrong in your life or the things you don't have, against the things that you're grateful for, then you start realizing, okay, well, I have so much actually to be grateful for. Oh, yes. And even if you listen to other people, or if you think of other people and what's going on in their lives, then you realize, I actually don't have it as bad as them. So number one, to, to wake up properly with the right mindset is to begin with the attitude of gratitude. Ah. Jy het nou vir ons so mooi geleer vir oogend, jy het vir ons geleer van just go into an attitude of gratitude. So die oomlik wat jy wakker word en jy voel, ek voel nie baie lekker nie, ek so my skyns beduivels vandag, want punt 1, ek het wakker word, punt 2, ek wou nie eers my hier gewees nie, punt 3, die springs en die matras het, het my gister aand gesteek en, en net niks het recht gegaan nie, um, dan moet ek denk, ok, Die spring het my gesteek, maar as ek net so le, dan is die bed beter, so dankie vir die bed wat op die punt beter is. En um, ja, ek wou nou nie wakker geword het nie, ek wou nie eers my hier geweet het nie, maar ek is hier so en as ek so mag dan, ek het daarom nog licht in my longe en uh, hey, plus punt, my kussen was sag gewees. Hey, mm. plus punt, ek het ook om baars gehad. Plus ja. punt, uh, ek het in een pajamas geslaap. Hmm. Uh, wat ek sal sê is vergelijk jezelf. Um, mens wat die raadships is vooral jy leer om dankbaar te wees vir die kleinste goed, a tannenborsel a koekie seep, a stikkie brood as jy in so positie is, dink aan iemand wat op die straat bly, dink aan iemand wat miskien in een karavaanpark bly, en dan gaan jy begin achterkom hoeveel jy eindelijk het om aan God voor dankbaar te wees. Baie, baie ongelooflik. Dijn, ek, ek denk baie keer, um, <clears throat> jy weet, ek is nou in die positie, wat ek enige tyd kan opstaan, en een beker koffie gaan maak. Weet jy hoe dier is koffie, as jy op die straat bly? Dit is ja. like dier. Ek, ek, ek het altyd by McDonald's koffie gekoop, en ek denk, was dus 25 rand, of 20 rand, vir die, dis nou die, the bottom of the range, jy weet, en dan, as ek nou, weet, vir, vir die geld, van vijf, kopbekers koffie, of uh, tabs koffie, by McDonald's, kan ek, a hele blik koffie gaan koop, en dit kan my hele maand hou, um, Marlijn sê, ek het in een wit plakkerskamp, ge, 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 geblei, en karre opgepas, Marlijn, visbamp vir jou, my girl, visbamp, Ek het nie mm. kaal opgepas nie, maar ek, ek het ook op, in, pas ook in een squatterkamp, so prijs die Heere daarvoor. Ons het dinge gesien wat ander mense nooit sal sien nie. Prijs die Heere daarvoor. Daai is, daai is a awesome journey. As jy daar vanaf terugkom, is jy baie dankie vir, uh, jy is baie dankie vir a flushing toilet. Jy is, mm. jy is baie dankie dat jy nie planiekies hoef te maak. Um, Sherry sê, Ek was ook al op straat geblei. Robert Chick, ons, ons, ons is, we are the, the biker chicks from Mars, denk ek. <laughs> Dit is, um, ek denk as jy, 
Elke dangetje wat jij vandaag in je leven eet, net met gratitude hanteer, dan, is, dan maak je half die, die dieren op vir, vir meer om te kom en vir beter om te kom. Hmm. En ik denk ook al als jij in een depressed state is, hallo Daniel, voor als jij in een depressed state is, hoe, hoe, Daniel, Dan is het eerst moeilijk om als een depressed person op iets positief te focus. Is, is, it, is it possible or not? Kijk, um, dit, dit vat verschrikkelijke, vooral iemand met major depressive disorder. Iemand wat verschrikkelijk depressief is, voor hulle, hulle is in so law plek, dat dit is vir hulle moeilik om even aan joy te denk, aan peace, aan love, aan al dat goed. Dit is moeilijk, maar het takes a lot a lot more effort than it would for someone else. So for iemand wat depressief is, wat in a deep depressie... Is kies daar? Nee, dit is doodrag. Oké, okay, so, vir mense wat in a deep, deep gat van depressie is, um, hulle sien die lewe basically in swart en wit. Uh, everything has lost its color, there's no joy in anything, there's no peace in anything anymore. So dit is vir hulle een baie groot struggle. So dit is een intensieve en is een lang pad wat, wat jy met so'n mens moet stap. Mm. Maar ek begin om vir hulle te sê, al doen ek het in persoon met hulle, ons maak een lysie en ek guide hulle vir alles wat voor hulle dankbaar is. En dit hou hulle na baan hulle, al moet hulle dit tegen hulle dak plak, langs hulle bedkassie sit, en net dier hy lysie lees, en kyk, okay. waarvoor hulle kan dankbaar wees. Want as hulle wakker word, en hulle is in a, a negative state, hulle, they're not able to think even, positively. As het daar voor hulle is, langs hulle is, dan kan hulle dit begin lees. Maar dag vir dag vir dag, die mind is moest een wonderlijke ding. Uh, it takes seven days to form a habit. So hoe meer hulle na die lysie kyk, hoe meer gaan hulle begin vinnig kan deurlees dier die lysie, want hulle weet nou al wat is bullet number one, bullet number two, bullet number three. So dit gaan habitual begin word, a positive habitual behavior. En dit gaan hulle kan laat besef, oké, okay, ek kan aan die positief ook dink, en dis waar jy dan kan begin met lamently werk, om aan die licht te kan focus, ja. om hulle van die donker plek af, na die licht toe te kan vat, want jy moet eerst daar aan werk, want jy kan soveel advies gee, en sê, dinge gaan beter ook, moet nie worry nie, alles gaan oké okay wees, dis net die donker wolk, vir die persoon beteken die woorde niks, Jy moet saam met hulle uitvind, hoekom is hulle in die depressie. Jy moet die wortel, soos ons nou nou gesê het, ontdek. Want dan gaan dit weggaan. Dan gaan dit begin, stelselmatig, beter word vir hulle. Jy moet hulle brein basis rewire. Rewire the brain. Um, Lizette sê hier so, o Lizette sê, excuse as ek jou naam verkeerd uitspreek, my ma is oorlede, meer as een jaar terug, en ek het nog glad nie geheil nie. Ai. Ja, daar is theories van stages of grief, waar dier mense gaan, en as daar een blokkasie is, om die emosie te release, sal iemand met jou moet werk om uit te vind, hoekom kon jy nog nie heil nie? wat is die wortel daarvan, en dit vereis, jy moet met iemand praat, want amal is individueel en, gen- en uniek, ja. my story is nie jou story nie, maar ek het al van tevore van iemand gehoor, wat nie kon huil, toe hulle ouwer oorlede is nie, want hulle kon, toe hulle klein was, was hulle nie toegelaat om te huil nie, toe was hulle gesê, slik jou trane, wees nou sterk, hou nou op, en dit het hulle oorgedra, 
en verhoudings en, en allerhande ander goed en so you have to realize what is the trauma what is the blockage so jy kon self of hulle het self vastgemaak dat ek mag nie heil nie it's a sign of weakness dit is nie a behavior that's not acceptable wat heil is eindelijk die wonderlikse ding wat jy kan doen, want dit release, en as jy heil, release jou brein sekere chemicals, en sekere goed wat jou uplift, en dat beter voel. So ek sal sê, mens moet op die root van die issue kom, van die blockage. Because it could have been formed in childhood, it could have been formed in later life, of it kan totaal in al net wees, dat die skok so erg was, dat uh, jy disassociate en dit voel nie vir jou reel nie. So jy het dit nog nie eindelijk voel jy kon proces nie, as dit sin maak. Yes, dit is, dit, is, dit maak perfecte sin. Dain, hierso is nou counter um, opmerking, Dorothy sê, my ouders is al twee voor my oorlede, paar maanden terug, ek huil elke dag, wat nou? So ons sit met iemand wat nie kan huil nie, glad nie kan huil nie, en een ander persoon, wat elke dag heil, um, wat sê jy dan? Eerstens, um, my condolences, Dorothy, um, ek kan nie imagine hoe jy voel nie, maar ek weet, dit is verschrikkelijk seer, vooral omdat het nou so rauw plekje is, uh, paar maanden terug, dit is, dit is, dit is nog steeds so een rauw wond, Ja. So die emoties en gevoelens en dat jy heil, dis goed, dit moet uit. Dit is hoe jy deel met die eina en die trauma. So it's not a, a bad thing. Maar, um, ek dink dit sal ook belangrik en van baie baad wees, as jy iemand kan sien, dok dier Dr. Marinda, wat jou kan help dier die rouw proces want jy kan heil omdat jy hulle verlang, jy kan heil omdat jy ook skuldig voel, jy kan heil omdat jy nie kon koebaai sê nie, jy kon heil omdat dit ook nie te eeuwiskielik was, en jy was nie raag om aan te gaan sonder hulle nie, wat meeste mense ervoor, so om op die voortel van dit te kom, is baie belangrik, dier die rauw proces, iemand wat saam met jou kan stap, iemand wat jou kan help en adviseer, dat jy dier dit kan werk, want dit is nie makkelijk nie, en het is baie moeilik om dit alleen te doen, want onthou enige vorm van trauma of seer of eina, you're so broken, hoe kan iemand wat in stikke is, die stikkies by mekaar sit, dit is wat ek altyd sê, dit is baie moeilik, dit is, daar ek hou ons, ons is, dit is baie moeilik, en, <coughs> Dorothy is al bezig om met my te gesels ek Oe, begin ook ben um, as Daniel hier onder is Daniel is jy nog hier so onder um, ek dink miskien het sal een goeie idee wees as yes Daniel, um, ek gaan vir jou Dorothy so nummer aanstuur ek dink dit is miskien een goeie idee dat, um, Dan, dat Dorothy op jou groepie kom um, net vir bykie ondersteuning daar, so ek weet nie of jy nou raak gelees het nie, um, maar ouwers is een paar maanden terug en sy, sy treer verskrikkelijk. So, dit is een goeie ding dat sy treer, ons is, Dan en ek is al twee baie blij, um, maar ek dink, miskien net bykie die handkie vasthou en net die enkie saam met haar loop. So, um, hmm. daar sê Daniel, die groep van jou word net groter. En zelfs in ingeval van moord van een geliefde is dit normaal om te rage? Ja, dit is baie normaal. Want die woede gaan uitkom. En dat is een proces met, um, met dood. Dit hang af hoe die persoon dood is, wat het gebeur, elke scenario is uniek. Maar die rage kom uit, want jy vraag vir jouself, hoe kom? En sielkundig dink ons dat, ach nee, wat um, slechte dinge gebeur nie met my nie. Ek hoor het op die nies, ek sien het op die TV, ek sien het hier, ek sien het daar. En die rage wat manifesteer is um, partly because of that, maar ons ander faktore ook. 
want jy is kwaad, hoekom het dit gebeur? Jy het al kwaad vir die land, die government, jy het al kwaad vir alles, en um, kwaad vir die reid is a totally normal response. Yes. Jy kan, jy kan tot kwaad raak vir God en vraag jy dit, waar, hoekom, waar, why did you allow this? Ja. En jy kan tot kwaad raak vir jyself, ja. want kon ek nie iets doen nie, hoekom het ek nie iets gedoen nie, ja. hoekom het die Heere nie ingegryp nie, hoekom het het gebeur, ek het om nodig, of ek het daar nodig gehad, ek was nie recht nie, ek kon nie baie sê nie, ja. en as het voor jou gebeur het, is daar ander einde aan goed wat ook uitkom. Ja, ja, maar dan, dan het jy, dan het jy trauma counseling nodig. Enige trauma wat jy gesien het, um, jy weet, ons besef dit nie altyd nie, maar ons, ons rui in ons kar en daar is een ongeluk, nie is een erg ongeluk nie. Jou lyf het geskrik en, en mm. die body memory, die, die, li- die body onthou hoe jy gevoel het. So, as jy skrik, gaan gesels, Die ouwe mens het altyd suikerwater ingegee, um, maar, maar ook saam met die suikerwater en saam met die soetie, het die ouma en die tannie het saam met jou gesit en gesels. En mm. that's what we don't do anymore, want jy bly daar in no. jou complex en ek bly daar in my complex en oe, oh, skies, ja, yeah, ok, that happened, ok, sien jou morgen. Ons het nie meer die, we care about each other nie. Die oumas en die tannies het geweet om te kansel, hulle, hulle was kanselers no. dit. So, as jy nou, en iemand vast reverse, gaan drink, koppie koffie, koppie thee, saam met jou vriendin, sê van, daarom ek het nou so geskrik man, ek het hier in vast gerei, en dan vijf minuten later, en sê, weet jy, en die kar was rooi, en, en, en toe ek net weer sien, toe is ek in die kar vast, en, en dan drink jy nog bykie thee, en jy eet bykie koekies, en jy sê, maar, weet jy, ek het so geskrik, nie, toe ek nou in hierdie, dis daai, repetitive, jy bring uit, jy bring uit, en, en sonder dat jy dit weet, you are healing. Want nou, reverse jy in die kar, jy skrik jou kajibers af, en, en jy rui my net verder, en, en jy koud my net verder, en volgende keer, dan wonder jy, hoekom, as ek kar net na by jou kom, dan ruk jy die stierwiel, en jy, 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 jy verstaan nie, daai keer toe jy in die kar reverse het, het die effect op jou gaan, en you never dealt with it. Dis so eenvoudig, soos, kyk die draak in die oog, sê, this is what happened, en dan kyk ek die draak weer in die oog, en vijf minuten later kyk ek om weer in die oog, en allemaal rond om jou sê, mm, ja, jy moet nou bykie oor het kom, screw them, screw them, it's not their trauma, it's your trauma. You stay in the place where you deal with things, anders moet jy a counselor gaan geld betaal, prijs die heren ons charge nie geld nie, maar ander counselor charge geld, anders moet jy in a counseling office gaan sit, en om weer te waar, hoekom jy gereeld die stier wil ruk, en dan kom die, die counselor af, op vijf jaar terug, het jy in a ander kaart vas rewees, damn, plaas het jy net by die tannie gaan thee drink, problem solved, maar nou draai jy hierdie ding so ver saam met jou, dat het, dis actually kon het dadelijk uitgesorteer geword het, but because you didn't, it became a problem later in life. That, I, I get from men so that no, a ongeluk, net nie weer bestuur nie. They just, no more driving. Can he? Deal, dadelijk, met die ding wat met jou gebeur. For all as jy skrik, deal dadelijk daarmee. So gauw is moeilijk. Nie nie nodig om geld, groot geld uit te haal nie. Baie keer is dit so eenvoudig, soos gaan nie just have a milkshake, coffee, whatever, kry die suiker in your life, praat met iemand. Sorry, Dan, ek het jou show gehijdek, vergewe my. Nee, man, dis eindelijk so waar, want die is daar vooral, dit kom al een lang pad, maar ek sien nou vooral na COVID, met die social distancing, en al hierdie goed, mense het die sens van hulle is, Hulle het een meer gebou. Dankie, Liesel. Hulle, <laughs> hulle het ook een meer gebou. Ja, met, met die COVID sê jy, het hulle die meer gebou. Dit is hmm. self-isolation. Die Illuminati ja. het meer aan ons te doen, ons doen het sommer aan ons self. Of, wat ja. praat ek nou hierso? Wat beleer ek nou ondinge hierso? Skies julle. 
en, en dit het mense meer in een spasie ingesit van my boekie, my probleme, my issues, my gesin. Die individuality is nou so erg, dat hulle nie eindelijk meer baie liefde en omgewees teen wat hulle meer de mens nie. En is eindelijk so hard seer. Ja. Want jy het mense, ons is, we social creatures. Ons is. As dit sin maak. Dit, dit is, dit is, weet jy, ek, ek kyk nou, um, my leven, elke persoon hier so, en ek kyk nou, my leven, ek is baie keer so hektiekie bezig, en per ty keer, voor het ons klaar maak met die live, dan uh, laai die phone klaar, dan, dan, ek wil nog die live eind, maar dan laai die phone klaar, en dan sê ek, van een oproep, tot de op, volgende oproep, en dan kijk ik op mijn laptop, en ik zie die boodschappen beginnen zo so in te komen. En dit is dus, um, je bike hier stap aan de linie, en dan zet ze ook een koffie voor mij neer. En dan is ik net, je weet, uh, thank you, want ik is op een counseling call bijvoorbeeld. En, maar dit is die punt wat ons moet beseffen. Je weet, daar heb je koffie, betekent voor mij die wereld. Somebody cares. Mm. Jy weet, miskien, miskien, kon ek vir my kanselier gesê, 5 seconds, hy, dat ek al net een drikkie geem van sê, thank you girl, you mean so much. Jy weet, vir my. Dis daai, waar as ons kan leer, om uit te reik na mekaar, as ons my, in, iemand dat bietje onder pressure is, reik uit, maar jy wat under pressure is, reik jy terug uit, because the deliverer of your your peace, your gesture of kindness, probably also needs a hug. But let's just start to meet each other's heart here. Want ek denk dan, dan is daar nie so groot behoefte vir kanselers, soos wat daar heidiglik is nie. Ja, dit is so waar. Om net, as iemand uitdruk na jou toe en vraag, is jy ok? Mense treeg gewoonlik op en sê nie, ek is ok, dankie en jy, en daai persoon sal terug sê, nee, ek is ok. In plaas van net om daai heen en weet, it's kind of a repetitive ding, het die selfde respons. So as haai hoe gaan het, gaan goed, dankie. Vroeg vroeg persoon, is jy rarig? Ok. Kan ons bykie praat, kan ek jou bykie bel. Want betekend wat mense doen, as hulle nie ok is nie, en hulle het jou nodig, sal hulle uitreik na jou doen vir jou vroeg, is jy ok, om een gesprek te begin. En dan respond jy net simply met, ja nie, ek sal kijk, dankie en jy. En dan gaan hulle ook net sê, hoe ook kijk, dankie ek ook. It's not gonna move further. Dit is, dit is die, Rudy, ek gaan nou, asjeblief, nee, as ek nie, I I see you, dit is baie belangrik. Ek wil net gauw gauw daar so, inkom by wat jy gesê het is, ek het lang terug, het ek, ek is, ek vergeld, as ek een boek hou het, en so ek het, Ek het baie, I have a business mind, en so as ek jou bel, en ek vraag vir jou, Dan, hoe gaan dit met jou? Dan moet jy weet, I care. As ek vir jou bel, en dan sê, Dan, luister dit en dit en dit, moet jy weet, ek wil nie nou weet, hoe dit met jou gaan, I actually don't care. Ja. My uitgangspunt is die volgende. O, en die trap iemand na uit te sê, of my weet jy, jou maam moes jou eindelijk bietje groter gemaakt, beter groot gemaakt, het jy het nie telefoon meneer nie. En die vraag, maar wat het ek verkeerd gedoen? Toe sê sy, wanneer iemand bel, dan vraag jy, hoe gaan dit? En toe denk ek by myself, but I don't care. Hoe kom sal ek vraag, hoe dit gaan? I don't care. Ek bel jou net, verbezigheid, en as jy my bel, ek is een boekhouder, dan bel jy my verbezigheid, I don't care. I don't care, en, en daar het my nogal, en, en ek het vir baie land, was ek baie trots daar op, I do it like a verse, jy verstaan, I, I don't care, I can't care, en het het my baie lang gevat om te besef, wat sy vir my probeer sê, is, net daar, hoe gaan dit, maak die deur oop, maar die moeilijkheid is, hoe gaan dit, kan die deur oop maak, vir die jylle, dit gaan nie goed met my nie, En, en die vraag wat jy jouself moet afvraag, as iemand sê, dit gaan nie goed met my nie, is ek reg om 5 of 10 minute af te staan en te luister. Want die, die simpel, dit gaan nie goed met my nie. 
it could save a life. It just could save a life. So now Balia, the, the uh, call center by APSA in that person, Frau, how are you? And you say, I'm not well. I'm considering ending my life. And I person say, no, please don't, 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 don't do this. And that person says, it could save a life. I get because I used to be very money driven and for enig iemand daar buiten wat vandag in a job is, wat jy, jy moet perform, jy het nie tyd vir chit-chat nie. Dit is moeilik, but that could save a life, guys. En ons kan maak dat die counselors onder werk sit, because we listen to each other. Rudy vraag, hoeveel mense op die groep voel, oor groep sessions, oor specifieke um, topics en issues? Daar oor, Dain, wat sê jy? Yeah. Um, group counseling, group sessions or specific issues. Kom eens kijk wat sê. Uh, precies, mens kan altyd luister, true story, dis hoe kom ek altyd sê, dit gaan goed. Oké, okay, moet gaan, geseen dit dag. Liesel, laat jy mooi gaan, sy is nog hulle jero ook. Stel nie sê, ek pak uit en antwoord hulle met a jylle back full klacht is. Daar sy stel nie, let's go, let's go. Eventueel. Ok, um, ja, Rudy is hier, wil topic specific group sessions op die app sit, allemaal wat dier abusers is, either TikTok of Teams, yes, yes, ja, ja. absolutely, Rudy, absolutely, Dain en ek het nou probeer verstaan, wil jy gauw in die boksie klim, Rudy? Ek het nog een paar goed om, <laughs> om ook te verduidelik. Ek, ek doog het laaf ons ge... Excuse, excuse, Dan. Continue, I'm so sorry, my apologies. Nee, dis, dis 100%. Um, een van die... Oké, okay, ek was nou deel die... Uh, deel die post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. Wat gelink is aan, aan childhood trauma en, en abuse. Yes. En nou die... Jy krijg verskillende anxiety disorders, wat ook daan gedink is. Een van dit is generalized anxiety disorder. En dit is specifiek associated met physical abuse en sexual abuse during childhood. Ja, dat, dat en is... Childhood, ja, dit is een groot enigie ook. En childhood interpersonal trauma is ook gedink uh, to the increased likelihood of developing phobias, soos social phobia, and panic disorder. And that panic disorder and social phobia develop as a result of chronic fear. And then what the mensa passes bang for other mensa in in a stimulus that a lot dink aan die specifieke event wat anxiety provoking was. Ok, dit is, dit, dit is nie necessarily related nie. Ons het net nou gepraat oor die kersvlammekie en die actual burning. It's, mm-hmm. there is no real fear, it just makes you think back. It makes you smell the smoke, but there is no smoke, there is no flame. Ja, ja die, die, Die social phobia develop as a result van, van dit en die stimulus om dit. Dis ook om hulle nie om mense wil wees nie, want die mens dom het hulle seer gemaakt. Want hulle sit met interpersonal trauma. So iemand kan ook a phobia later in hulle leven develop. Sê nou maar hulle is in die see en die see slik hulle in en hulle kan nie uitkom nie en eerst na a half uur of iets wat die golf hulle weer strand toe, die mense sal nooit weer na by die see kom nie. Ook ek nie. Ja. <laughs> ja, so dit is, die, die stimulus kan a uh, intense emotional uh, action trigger in die persoon. Yes. En dan nog een ding is depressie, is ook highly linked aan childhood trauma. En depressie is een mood disorder. Hmm. En meeste survivors van childhood trauma develop major depressive disorder, co-morbid, wat beteken saam met 
post-traumatic stress disorder. En hang af hoe lang die trauma was, dan develop hulle chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. Vooral as die trauma in die childhood gebeur het en toe in een verhouding vir waar een narcissistic abuse in die type van goed was, dan word het chronic post-traumatic stress disorder. Want dit is een chronische ding wat die heel tyd en die heel tyd gebeur. En dan die, die personality disorders wat highly linked is aan childhood trauma. Um, volgens navorsing, sexual abuse is associated with paranoid, uh, paranoid disorders, schizoid, borderline, avoidant personality, and physical abuse is highly related with antisocial personality disorder. And psychological abuse is related with schizotypical, borderline, avoidant, independent, as well as obsessive compulsive personality disorders. And this work could link on borderline personality disorder and DID. Weet jy, dit is, dit is my verskrikkelijk um, <coughs> om te denk, <coughs> excuse, dat in order om te survive, in order to survive childhood trauma, the personality mm. has to split. Because if the personality does not split, I will die. Mm. Ja, vooral met, met DID. Yes. DID is geassocieer met severe traumatic physical and sexual abuse, want dit gebeur op een ouderdom waar die kind developmentally sekere milestones moet reach yes. en hulle self en hulle ideal self word geseparate. Totally, totally. So, Elby vraag, kan men schizofrenie nie raak? Ja. Nou, sy vraag, kan jy dit raak of word jy so gebore? Ja, dis iets wat... Um, Dit, dit, dat is a genetic component in van die sake, ja, maar nie in meeste genetic. van hulle nie, maar dit kan oor a periode van a persoonse lewe, kan hulle dit begin ontwikkel. So sekere goed kan gebeur, daar kan biological vulnerabilities wees, daar kan trauma wees wat dit veroorzaak, En een van die major goed wat het veroorzaak, hulle noem het drug-induced uh, psychosis, en dit kan een persoon dat schizofrenies word. Dit het soos permanent, hulle het een bad trip, soos wat hulle sê, ja. en dan het hulle schizofrenie, of raak hulle schizofrenies. En meeste van die patiënten of um, mense, wat eindelijk hardseer is, eindig op op die straat, van die ja. familie kan nie meer, hulle is normaal nee, weg, nie. nie gevaarlik nie, they're not a danger to society, their behavior is just scary to witness, want hulle het hallucinations, en hulle het delusions, en erratic ways of, of, of behavior, dat mense bang maak, so jy kan nie met hulle eindelijk huis hou nie, yes. en jy interpreteer hulle delusions, wat die hulle gaan is, hulle so erg, dat jy begin bang raak vir hulle. Dit is, dit is die, die groot ding, en nie allemaal <coughs> het die finansies om actually iemand in te boek in Witpoort of Sterkfontein of um, you know, wherever, nie, nie allemaal het die finansies nie, en soos jy sê, dan, dan eindig jy die mense op straat op, want niemand kan huis hou nie, Jeben, hallo, goeiemiddag, hoe gaan dit? Jeben, jy gaan morgen vir jou operatie, nee? Ons gaan vir jou bid voor ons hier klaar maak. Dan, dit is, dit is bad, nee? Schizofrenie is nie, dit is nie een speel, denk ek jy daar nie. <coughs> nee, dit is rarig een erge conditie, en dit is vir die mense om hulle op baie moeilik, dit is vir hulle self moeilik, 
and hulle suffer van delusions en hallucinations en goed. Hulle sal bijvoorbeeld denk daar is mense wat na hulle luister dier die TV of yeah. daar is goed wat onder hulle vuil haar kloop en mense conspire against hulle. Daar is verskillende type delusions. Een van dit is a delusion of prosecution. Yes. Waar hulle denk hulle word dier die FBI gevolg en um, ek het al een van my vriende sy ma hy het skizofrenie en hy onthoud toe hy klein was, hy was 8 jaar oud, toe het hy en die ma in die kas weggekryp vir amper 5 ure, want sy het gesê, daar is mens op die dak wat wil inbreek. Dit is, dit is amper um, oor deerliggend of, of deerlopend eerder, is daar hierdie vervolgingswaansin. They are out to get me in, in verskillende maniere, soos wat jy sê, dit is altyd a wegkryp, um, great super, uh, um, suspicion, nie super suspicion, nie, great suspicion, dit is net a place, um, Albie sê, jy hoor mense praat, maar daar is niemand nie. Albie, um, ek wil net vir jou sê, as dit jou moeilikheid is, reik asjeblief uit na ons toe, want jy weet skizofrenie en DID, word baie keer misgediagnoseer. Um, so daar is een fijn, baie, baie fijn lijn tussen um, schizofrenie en dissociative identity disorder. So, reik asjeblief uit, um, my telefoon is op ons baie, as jy daar klik, dan, dan krijg ek jou call dadelijk. Niemand hoef meer te soek nie, daar is niks meer genommer die MRI nie. Um, dit is Jy kan my, ons baie makkelijk in die hande kry. Skies, Dain. Yes. Nee, dit is doodraag. Oké, okay, so kan ek touch op die, die repercussions mm. van die interpersonal trauma. Later in die persoon se, se leven. Yes. Oké, okay, so because inter, interpersonal trauma includes ele- elements of malevolence, betrayal, and disregard, which leads to feelings of insecurity about the trustworthiness of others, such as the caregiver. Uh, The child tends to develop disruptive styles of coping and relating to others and to themselves, as well as enduring cognitive models about the self, others, the world, and the future, wat inevitably die cognitive models, wat hulle vastmaak in hulle kop, genereer vir hulle meer probleme, hardships, in hulle volwasse lewe. En events, wat dier hulle dan gaan later experience hulle as meer traumatic, omdat die primary caregiver abusive was. Yes. So, um, dan die, die in, in short, is die effect wat met ons gebeur. Shada sê, thank you everyone. Ook ek, ek sê, thank you everyone. Ook dan nou sê. Dankie allemaal. So ja, dat is net een laaste dingiekie wat ek wil mention, wat ook een groot rol speel in, um, die persoon sy volwasse leven wat hier trauma is. En dit het te doen met hulle romantic relationships. So, the romantic relationships generally represent the most important yet challenging interactions for a majority of adults who have survived childhood interpersonal trauma. Hulle probleme met commitment en dit kan vir hulle moeilik wees om te commit, there is increased feelings of vulnerability, en dit trigger unresolved issues, emoties, denkwijse, weens die past traumatic experiences. Yes. Wat met hulle gebeur het, het een groot invloed op hulle verhoudings, wat hulle het met hulle romantic partners later, en hulle is meer 
lightly om in verhoudings te report dat hulle is dissatisfied, dat hulle wil sky en dat hulle nie hulle partner kan vertrouwen nie, al weet hulle hy of sy is daar vir hulle no matter what en kan net die beste vir hulle gee. So hulle sikkel verskrikkelijk om te commit, want hulle fundamental schema van hoe verhoudings werk en hoe verhoudings moet wees, is dysfunctional. Yes, weens yes. die voorbeeld wat hulle gehad het. En hulle report ook um, sexual dysfunction, hulle exhibit a lack of closeness, of feelings of affection, en hulle sikkel om oop te maak met hulle partner. Dit is, so, dit dit is, die, dit is die laaste basis effect wat dit dan het. In, um, in, in, the, in the field of romantic relationships. Ons was nou dier die, die psychological aspects en nou het ons gepraat oor die verhouding issues wat het kan veroorzaak. Ons het basis gepraat meer in detail oor die seelkundige afwijkings uh, wat mense ontwikkel of wat gelink is aan childhood trauma en oor hulle gepraat en in diepte gegaan daar en toe praat ons oor die repercussions wat het het vooral in verhoudings met mense later aan in hulle leven as hulle survivors is van psychological, physical childhood abuse. Yes. Elke live gaan op YouTube skies duin. Skies. Maar ons moet mooi dankie sê. If it comes, we must stay. Ja, baie dankie allemaal. Dankie vir allemaal wat hier was en allemaal wat gegeeft het en allemaal wat geluister het. Ons waardeer dit. En ja, as jylle hero badge soek en a kans wil staan om 100 liter fuel te wen, subscribe as a blief. Dit gaan vir een goeie rede. Ons doen free counseling, ons is hier, as jylle ooit enige raad of advies of sommer maar net een oorkoord om te luister, contact vir Marinda. Ons is hier vir allemaal daar buiten. Absoluut. En wat is ons fooi nou weer, Dan? <coughs> 0,00 cent. Ha! 0,00 cent voor uitbetaalbaar. Daai 0,00 cent, ek betaal om voor die, voor die session begin. As jy nie 0,00 cent <laughs> ja. betaal, dus rand cent betaal het nie. Ha, ha, sê ek al ook vir jou, ons soek 0 rand. <laughs>